What is the business model of Dextery? How do you, why do you think that is optimal for the business and where do you see it going? We operate a subscription, um, subscription model because the value we bring to our customers is done through our software platform. What the, what's your key insight in building the team to make this happen? Because it seems to me like such a huge operation that you must be so excellent at hiring. The more you can bring people with different um, specialties and different backgrounds together, the better and the faster you're going to be at problem solving. What is the one piece of advice that you would give the you know, founders that are building really hard things? You know, be it robotics, you know, um, you know, automation for traditional industries, something really difficult to adopt. If you really care deeply, deeply about solving that problem, you will find a way to make it work. Hey everyone, and welcome to BitBuilders, where we sit down with the greatest minds building and exploring robotics in construction and space. Before we get started though, if you're a startup founder or operator, responsible for innovation in your company, or you want a deeper, more insightful look into technology in AEC, you won't want to miss our newsletter. From deep dives into particular technologies such as AI, robotics, design, software, and so on. Hot takes from investors betting big in AEC technology and advice on building tech companies, including the stories and takeaways of the most successful AEC technology founders. Head over to wwwbricks bytescom and sign up today to get this exclusive material straight to your inbox. And now for the episode. Hello, welcome, Andre. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, do you want to, you know, you know, kick started by introducing yourself? Um, absolutely, no problem at all. So um, I'm Andre. I'm one of the founders and the chief executive officer of Texery. Um, I'm a person with a technical background, um, massive passion for robotics, and a big big passion for for solving complex problems this is probably this is probably one of the biggest drivers that's kind of like pointed me in the direction of of starting this company with my co-founders and, and what's the the one liner i promise you will go down and understand you know much more every single word of that sentence but what's the one liner for dexter um for dexter it's a global visibility platform for logistics okay a lot to unpack in you know each each one of these these words. I love it. The puzzles that I like. Um, that's great. I mean, how do you, you know, I always try to understand with people that build um, hard things, um, the robotics, uh, you know, space technology, construction technology. How does one get to that? Right. That's what one of the one of the biggest questions that I think our audience has. So, what did you do before? Uh, how did you? What was your early? Um, career and life that led you to function. So I think it's um, I think it's an interesting one because you kind of like asked me two or three questions there in one, right? Uh, how does one get to build this this complex things and get I don't know I guess um, attracted to this this difficult problems? Um, to be honest, I think it, it it boils down to to your inner drive, to your passion for that field. Um, and especially when you're looking at some of these things, which are, are very, very hard and they require, you know, years of passion and dedication and, and hard work, it's really important for your intrinsic motivation to be aligned with that. Um, my background before this was in engineering, I would say high performance engineering, as I, as I like to call it, um, so I've spent some time working in um, in the automotive um, industry, but before that, I spent quite a lot of time working in motorsport, um, and I tend to to always refer back to that. So um, I was um, a systems engineer in Formula One, um, and that was you know also a big big driver to kind of guide me in the direction of, of starting this company. Seeing how much, seeing how much information you can you can collect on an F1 car and how you can transform that information into a story that tells you the performance. It tells you what the driver is doing, what the, the car is doing, what the track is doing. It, it, it has it has so much potential to reveal so many things is, you know, I found it fascin fascinating um, and obviously I was working in it, so I can't claim it was fascinating because it was bread and butter, but 
you literally take take readings from sensors and you can tell a, a story and you can make split second decisions based on that. Um, and that that was one of the big one of the big drivers and what I found incredibly powerful. And that's why I wanted to apply to other businesses and other industries. I said, okay, if you can do this in F1, what's stopping us from using other technologies to collect information and then to help any business in pretty much any industry to become, to operate at that level of performance. Um, and obviously we, we decided to go um, at Texory, we decided to focus and go with the logistics industry and, and that's pretty much what we're doing. Okay, and, and, and people don't realize that, right? But F1 cars, they're not only fast. They're like, that's, that's one of the characteristics. I and mean, they're not only aerodynamic, they're also hyper intelligent. That's the way you, you improve those machines is by, you know, every single race, every single time you go back to the, um, you know, to the hangar where you're, you know, fixing it and, and creating, you're just taking so much data from the previous, uh, from the previous, you know, laps. Um, and just making so much, so many improvements. And that's a lot of the, it's probably the big difference between high performance engineering and just, you know, non high performance engineering is that you get to work with a lot of local minima, local maxima and what you're trying to optimize. Um, and that's very easy to process. And I love it. I, I imagine that forges a founder and it forges an engineer's mindset. Um, who are your co-founders and, when, when have you met them? What's that story? So um, I have two co-founders, um, Adrian and, and Wana. Uh, we've known each other since um, pretty much since we were in, in secondary school. And um, what that gives you is, is that opportunity to build incredibly strong, strong relationships. And, um, you know, when you start the company, it's, it's always going to be a hard journey. So having having co-founders that you have had this this long lasting relationship with that builds a level of trust that really um it ensures that you will always push through and find solutions and make it work through pretty much through to, through thick and thin like i don't think there's been any problem that we've had to face where we were like oh my god we're never going to be able to to push through this we've always had this sort of like um mindset of, of finding solutions and supporting each other and challenging each other as well. But when you have these long lasting relationships, I think it's, um, it's really helpful because you know that each and every one of us has the, the company's best interest at heart. So it's never a, a personal thing or it's never sort of like a, a, an ego thing. It's like, we want to challenge each other. We want to find the best solution for the business. And I think it's specifically valuable when you're looking at solving some of the hard problems or in our case, for example, building a, building a full stack technology company, um, you know, you have everything in house from design, engineering, manufacturing, production, deployments with customers, customer support service, you know, end to end. You can think about it. We have it. It's, it's included in the way we've built our business. Um, and, and us having that bond and having that, that strong relationship, um, really helped us a lot on the way. And, and. How did the idea come together? What was the like a summary of the idea maze there? So where did you start? Was that a, was a problem focused? Was it a I don't know customer or early pivot? How did you come to building what you're building? And maybe it's a good time to touch on what is it that you're building specifically? Because I think it'll blow people's mind <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Because I hadn't seen your robots before we spoke. Uh, the last time. And then I looked them up. I was like, what? So, <laughs> so just maybe, maybe, you know, you can mix it up, but idea maze and, and, you know, where did you land? Um, yeah. So I think, I think that's an, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting area for discussion because we started with the idea. So, so I had an idea about, um, being able to collect this information and, drive efficiency really can access the, those higher higher echelons of performance. And from the beginning, when we first first thought about starting the company, the concept was to use autonomous robots and collect this information from, from pretty much any environment, any space. Hey listeners, I want to take a quick break to remind you about the Bricks and Bytes newsletter. If you're interested in learning about the technology shaping the future of construction, you won't want to miss the valuable insights we share each week. To get this exclusive content delivered straight to your inbox, 
head over to www.bricks-bytes.com and sign up today. Link is in the show notes. Back to the show. Now, that probably is, is, is what we call it in its, in its purest form or purest form of the concept is you use robots, collect data, tell a story, become more efficient. Um, when we first started the company, we bootstrapped for very, uh, for a very long time because it was quite difficult to fund a full stack business, you know, nine years ago. <laughs> um, but what that was, um, was, you know, that was incredibly powerful because it forced us to always work very, very closely with a customer. So you, you can say we never had the luxury to just say, Oh, we could just build some cool technology and then we'll figure out what problems it solves. We always started with the problem. So we had a concept in mind. Okay. We can use these robots, collect some information and help businesses, right? But what problems we solve with that concept and how the technology ends up looking, that's where we work very closely with, with the market, very closely with customers because it's incredibly important to solve the customer problem, to find, first of all, find the customer problem, make sure it's, it's a big problem, make sure they're keen to solve it and then find a way to solve it using your technology. You, that's probably the natural progression of things. You don't want to start with a technology and then find some customer, maybe one, maybe two, maybe 10 customers, because that would be a much harder approach to much harder approach to bringing something into the, into the market, bringing something new into the world. So that helped us a lot, you know, being able to be close to customers, being able to stay in touch with the market, being able to work with our customers to make sure that our technology and our product at the end of the day um, serves them and solves, solves the, the problem they have. Um, that, was, that was a huge advantage. And yeah, I know you mentioned robots. I didn't mention anything about robots yet. So <laughs> I think sort of like the second part of that, um, of that question is, is what do we do? So um, I said Dexory has a, a product that is a, a global visibility, a global intelligence platform. It's called Dexory View. Um, it's a digital twin platform focused uh, or with with a with a focus on the logistics industry on warehousing and what's really unique about what we do is the fact that all the information all the data we collect is by using autonomous robots so we're very proud to say we have the world's tallest autonomous robot it's uh, it, it's it's over 14 meters tall and the second world's tallest autonomous robot because we can we have the, the the shorter version of that technology as well um but but what's important there is, you know, the robots per se are being used to acquire this information. We transform this data into insights. We transform this raw data into um, specific points of uh, points of information around the warehouse, and we push it in Dexo Review, which is our digital twin platform. So from that point of view, you have uh, you have one software platform where you can log in and have complete visibility, complete access over your entire warehousing and logistics operation. Okay, so keeping robot moving around in your warehouse and collecting data, you know, endlessly and plugging that into your systems. What's the pain point there? So I, I can imagine like my level, my high level pain point is quite clear, right? You need to know what's on your shelves. You need to know what's the capacity level of every single one of the racks that, you know, compose your, uh, your warehouse. Um, What's a deeper insight to that? So like, what are the KPIs that these companies are missing on? Uh, how do, and, and then commercially, basically, how do you track your, your value and your progress within these companies? Um, and how universal is that of a beam? So like yeah. on one side, you know, what are the least, um, you know, the least equipped to deal with the pain point? And without Dexury, what would the, you know, the best, companies do uh, in this field in terms of visibility on their, on their inventory, on their warehouses? So if you, if you look at it um, from, from a customer pain point, it's, it's a combination of factors that have exponentially increased this pain over the, the past couple of years. Um, first and foremost, logistics operations are ever increasing. We have started to buy more and more things online. There's a lot more um, influencer, um, commerce or like um, promotional driven commerce. So, you know, this 
for us as consumers, it's, it's, it's great. It's cool. You know, there's, you can be in, in, in touch with the latest trend. Then you can click a couple of buttons and order a product. It magically appears next day or in, in two days in, in your, in your house, at, at your house, in front of your house. There's a huge amount of work that goes in the, in the logistics industry, in the supply chain industry to make that possible, to make that happen. So if you think about it, um, you know, 10 years ago, Amazon was kind of like just starting up with things like Prime, same day, next day delivery was, was unheard of. Same day delivery was, but I don't, I don't even know if it was on the radar. Um, but that was a, that was a really important trend because that started this, this movement where, you know, as consumers, we want stuff to be delivered really quickly. So, you know, you, you fast forward that through, let's say through the, um, through the pandemic. And when you look at the pandemic, um, what that's created was an even bigger opportunity because a lot of businesses were, were forced to shut their, their physical operation and move things online. They realized they, they can run their business in a different way by using uh, and leveraging their online presences and so on. But also that came with a massive challenge because suddenly the same, you know, you, you, warehouses are not built overnight. So, you know, it's a huge construction. It's a huge project to, to extend or expand or even change your warehouse. So people wanted to be, you know, to run these spaces with 100% efficiency. Everyone wants 100% efficiency because no one wants to run an inefficient business. I don't think anyone starts, you know, their day thinking, how can I make my business more inefficient today? <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, everyone wants that. Um, and when you're paying for these massive, massive spaces, you know, you don't want to be storing air in there. You want to make sure that your utilization, your performance of this environment is, is really high. So that's one side of the challenge. The other big side of the challenge was the fact that the workforce was already stretched before we, we had any issues, global issues like the pandemic. Then during the pandemic, you had a bigger opportunity, but then you had to put more strain and more pressure on your existing workforce. And it was harder and harder to get more people. So what that did to the industry, it, it kind of like it was an eye opener and a lot of people thought, okay, technology can really, can really drive an impact, can really help us with this. So from that point of view, um, you know, those are some of the, those are some of the challenges that sort of like accelerated the adoption of our, of our technology, of our product into the market, because there's a combination of not enough labor. There's a combination of people. Nobody likes to do boring, repetitive jobs. So you want to make sure that you use your workforce in the most efficient way possible. And you want to make sure that at the end of the day, it's about using everyone to the best of their abilities. Yeah. So when you look at, you know, finding lost pallets in a hundred thousand pallet warehouse where you have everything is kind of similar, it's, it's a massive, it's a massive task. And you have, you know, tens of people that, that need to do that. Um, you know, and whilst they're doing that, they can't fulfill order for customers uh, or they can't, you know, um, spend their time making sure that the acceptance process is as efficient as possible and so on. So what we did with, with Dexo Review, we, we eliminate the need for that. We can give complete visibility over everything that's going in a warehouse. So that's a massive, um, that's a massive pain reduction in terms of finding anything. So you can search pretty much from anywhere in the world, you log into our platform, you can see what the warehouse operations are, are doing. You can search for any product. You can see how the product's being, um, is being stored. You can see how much space is available in the warehouse. So you can dive into further optimization areas where you say, okay, suddenly I want to put another 20, um, pallets worth of goods because there's a new product. I know it's up and coming. I know there's going to be some promotional activity around it. How do I store this product? Do I have enough space? Do I have to make, do I have to spend a day organizing my warehouse or can I fit it in an optimal way, which, which in turn allows me to basically maximize the use, maximize the value that I get out of my, out of my environment and out of my, out of my operation, uh, in the end. So, so when you look at Dexo review, like I was saying, you know, we start with this visibility piece that you were, um, you were kind of a hinting to, but then as you operate in the environment, as you start acquiring the information and data, you can go further into optimization. You can go further into really extracting the last, um, you know, like the last five, 10, 15% of, of performance, which make a huge difference. You know, you can say, okay, I have 3% errors in my warehouse. 
doesn't necessarily sound like a big number, but when you're talking 100,000 pallets, that can be a huge operational challenge. So being able to eliminate that, being able to run everything with, with, um, with zero errors, being able to be able to predict your utilization of space, being able to, to optimize ahead of, um, any kind of goods reaching your warehouse. You know, these are, these are some of the big value drivers that, you know, you just can't do with other, without the use of this technology. You, do, you, you cannot justify having, you know, tens of people going around the warehouse and, um, you know, taking pictures and sort of like recording information and then having to digitize this and then having another team of 10, 15, 20, um, you know, business intelligence folks that go through the data and then give you a result in a couple of days. This needs to happen pretty much at the click of a button. And that's exactly what, what we deliver through, through Dexo Review. And I'm curious on, on the way that you step foot into the customer's premises, because that, from what I understand in terms of the market, you have these warehouses that are really, they're really custom made. They're, they're, it's really hard to find a very similar schema or a very similar set of plans for, for a warehouse, unless it's from the same company. And I'm, I'm not even sure they standardize them themselves. So how do you guys, um, deploy and how do you guys make sure that customer has success with your product? Because this seems to me like the perfect model to have these four, the, the four deployed engineers. Balloons came out of my screen. But, um, <laughs> yeah, four deployed engineers, the way the volunteer does it, right? So it seems to me that you will, you will have to have a service component to go service this massive spaces and massive customers. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. So how do you, how do you guys serve? Uh, what, what's your approach to deploying? So I, I, you, I mean, you're not wrong at all. Um, almost every warehouse is, it's got its unique characteristics. And even for the same company, the same business, identical business units in different parts of the same country will have operations looking differently. And if you think about it, this is a, this is a really interesting example because let's say you operate 10 warehouses, right? Um, and you have one or two of them that are perfect. You know, they run with the ideal level of, um, efficiency. Yet you have five, six, seven, eight of those, which are not quite there yet. If you were to take the teams from one warehouse and move them to another operation to try and sort of like improve that operation, it takes so much time and effort and you have to get people. So like commuting long distances and, and it is a very complex um, endeavor that you need to embark on. That's exactly what Dexter Review allows you to do. It allows you to pretty much copy paste intelligence from one location to another. Now, the way we do this and the way we, um, the way we deploy with customers, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, we recognize this from the beginning. It's very important to have, um, to have a way of avoiding any kind of disruptions in the day to day way of, uh, of running this, this operations, this, this environment. So we were working closely with customers to understand what they want, understand kind of like how this product can best fit their, their lives, um, and, and their existence. Um, one of the big things we found is you need a, an incredibly advanced level of technological sophistication to make this work to a standard that customers just, you know, it, 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 it needs to become virtually invisible to customers, right? So um, one of the, the, the core pillars that we have as a company um, is our autonomy stack, you know, the ability to operate in these environments, the ability to deploy this robotic technology, which then obviously allows us to scan, re reconstruct the digital twin and collect the information, but the ability to deploy this technology in, in a few days in a warehouse of any size, you know, that is very special and we've spent a lot of time perfecting this um perfecting this technology but again so like not from a point of view of we just need technology that can be better than what we have yesterday from a point of view of going to a customer and saying look it will take us anything between one to two to three days to install this you won't have to make any infrastructural changes all we need is obviously um a power um outlet so we can recharge the robots um, but other than that, you know, this needs to be a seamless integration in the way you're running your operation. 
I think that's one of the that's one of the the big things about deploying and scaling robotic technology deployments. But I think that's also one of the hardest problems to solve because to be able to to cover this level of specificity across any type of location, to be able to have this this technology that allows you to deploy anywhere in the world um, and to deploy so fast, so quickly, so efficiently. You know, we spend years and years and years kind of, uh, building and perfecting and continuously evolving the way our autonomy tech stack works, the way even the way our robots are designed and, uh, and constructed. So I think it's, it's hard. It's not, I don't think there's like a magic, uh, kind of magic uh, formula for it. Um, I think it's the way you, it's basically the way you construct your company. Um, Dexter is a, is a full stack, full stack business, a full stack company. So we design and build everything uh, and we have complete control over our technology in house, uh, which in turn allows us to obviously create something that works very, very well in, in the industry, in the environment in which we operate. It's not definitely not the easy route to bring a product to market, but um, I think it's the best way to keep that constant tight feedback loop with the customers and create something that really that really solves the customer's problems and really integrates with their environment in the in the best way possible, in the most uh, efficient way possible as well. And what's the alternative? Give me the less and then the less vertically integrated version of that story. Like, what is it? If you have to schematically look at the functions that you guys perform, what is it that you could outsource? It would lower quality. It would lower, um, you know, you would lower USP. It would lower customers trust. Um, I really want to try to sketch that out for the audience. Um, so you have Dexury and the end deploy from the end, right? So, so I'm talking actually backwards from customer service deployment, uh, you know, development, manufacturing of the robots, so manufacturing development and then design. How would you potentially take a less ideal yeah. path? Uh, by having a less integrated X3. I don't know if the question makes sense. I want to try to draw a counteraction. I think, I think it makes sense. And I, I, I feel like I have an understanding or, or, or an inter- interpretation of what, what you're asking. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, for example, if you don't go down the specific product designed to solve a problem route and you try to make something that's very, um, that's very general. So, or you take something off the shelf that's a general general use type of robot and you want to adapt it to be able to do this or for it to be able to work in this application. Uh, when you look at that, um, you could say, okay, you know, there's AGVs out there in the market. There's um, AMRs and AGVs and other types of robots that you could use for scanning. Yes, on one hand, and, and there's platforms out there that have a huge, huge payload. Like you can mm-hmm. transfer a thousand kilos, two thousand kilos with them. But they're not designed for this level of precision. They're not designed for this application. So they're never going to be able to to deliver anything near the level of um, excellence that our platform does, right? So yes, okay, you can say, but but they, they can operate in this environment. Yes, but the difference is you need to operate. You know, we have some environments where we can continuously scan and recharge and scan and recharge. So the, the robots operate 24-7. It's a technology that's designed to, to interact with people. So not so much there's a, a human robot interaction per se, but it needs to, uh, seamlessly blend with the environment. So you don't want to have to close off areas of your warehouse because it's not, you can't, you, you can't have people going and, and doing work there because the robots are scanning. That's a very a suboptimal way of, of looking to deploy this technology. Um, and then you can look at other, you can look at other elements. So let's say you try and, and buy something off the shelf, um, you know, like a, a robot base, and then you make some adjustments, some modifications to it. You depend on an external manufacturer in this day and age, you know, at the end of the day, everyone runs a business and that product line might disappear. So you can either secure a large volume of stock or you're at basically at the mercy of the market. So you don't. If you're serious about your product, if you're serious about the value you bring to customers, you don't rely on someone else building your product um, because you you have no control over that, right? 
Full now, if so, full stack is equal to reliability, this works. Full stack, I think it's it. Full stack is equal to a level of excellence and a standard that you can be in control of. Um, I think if we make a, a parallel uh, with some of the some of the racing world, for example, it's like saying, "Oh, I can take a I can take a street car, make some modifications, and turn it into a race car." Yes, but then when you compete against a purpose-built race car, you have no chance. So it's a completely different thing. Yes, you're going to make it race. You're going to make it go around the track. But the difference in performance and the difference in reliability and um, the difference in what that that specific technology can achieve is huge. Um, and it's the same thing as saying, look, I can uh, I can move things. I don't need a truck. I can move things towing them with a trailer. It's either going to be very, very inefficient. So you're going to use a huge amount of fuel. You're not going to be able to um, operate nowhere nearly as long as a purpose-built truck would be able to operate. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think if you, if you're going to be, if you're going to be committed to the problem that you're solving for your customers, it's very, very important to have the right level of technology. And it's very, very important to have the right technology, the right product solve that problem. Um, I think if we, if we go back to, to the second half of that question is when you, bring a new product into the market, you don't want to, you don't want to give away that feedback loop that you get from the customers. So, you know, when you look at the full stack element, you don't, you, you can say, okay, I'm just going to get someone else to do the installation for me. That's fine. As you scale, as you become mature, as you can, um, as you control that market category that you're defining, that, that works well. But for the early days, you know, that customer feedback and that proximity to the problem you're solving, you know, that's more valuable than anything else. That's what's going to give you the unique insight into, into the industry, the unique insight into, into what people think about your product. And also very importantly, that's going to inform your roadmap into how you can improve your product and delight even more customers as you grow, as you scale, as you expand. And, and how does that tie back to, I guess, the way that you're calibrating, you've been calibrating over the years, your business model. So what is the business model of Dextery? How do you, why do you think that is optimal for the business and where do you see it going? If you see a different direction as you scale with different product lines, um, you know, beyond Dextery view, um, I'd love to understand. I actually, big focus of this podcast has always been a bubble with companies that are running robotics, uh, in, you know, traditional businesses is trying to understand how the business model has been chosen. And also how that choice has been informed by, you know, and why, right? So what are the factors that are behind that? Yeah. So I think it, it's definitely a, a good time to ask that question because we can, we can refer back to some of the conversation we've been having. So, um, the way we operate, we operate a subscription, um, subscription model because the value we bring to our customers is done through our software platform, through Dexter Review. Um, like we were discussing, you know, the robots are this incredible, the, the best way of, uh, the best way of, of capturing the data, capturing the information. But realistically, they need to be so good from a technological point of view, from a technical perspective that they become invisible to the day to day operation. The way we drive value, the way we bring value to our customers is through our software platform, through Dexter Review, through the digital twin platform. So the business model also needs to reflect that. Uh, we operate a subscription model. So customers, um, you know, we, we have a, a contract with our customers and then they pay us to subscribe to the review to the software. We will then go and install the robots. We'll make sure that everything works for them. And obviously we take a, a contractual commitment to be able to provide that information to, to deliver the value to them. But realistically, how this, how this came to be was with, uh, was based on a lot of conversation with the market. So understanding, understanding what's needed to encourage and drive fast adoption and is not trying to charge people huge amounts of money up front is making sure that you have a model that allows you, allows them to have an easy decision making to embrace the technology. And it allows us to continuously drive and return value. And in the future, when we have new modules, when we have new versions of our technology, because it's a subscription model, we can, we can work with our customers and say, Hey, 
um, you know, we could give you an upgrade. We could offer some additional value. We could difference, offer some additional modules. It's very, very similar to what you have with, um, with pretty much any software platform, right? You start with something in two years time, you know, we're, we're going to be able to bring a completely different level of, um, different level of product proposition. You want to make sure that you set up that di distribution channel to lend itself to that. So fine, you, you acquire data with similar type of robot. That's totally, totally uh, fine. But then being able to to bring the latest artificial intelligence, the latest algorithms, the latest interfaces, and and ways of extract extracting value from the data sets from the from the information you're gathering, that's one of the most important things. You want to future proof that business model. You want to make sure that you can. You have something that you can work with now, but very importantly, you have something that scales with you as a business and something that will work in the future as well. It's, it's interesting because you haven't mentioned any fee for the robots. So you're pretending like your robots are free within, within the customer's premises, right? Nothing is ever free in life, right? <laughs> you're, 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 so you're serving. The beauty of this is that it seems to me like a service company that will do the highest survey, highest quality survey and show it to you through the highest quality software. But actually there's no team. It's just a giant four story and something tall robot, right? Uh, so I mean, you know what? I think four, 14 meters is 45 feet uh, or something along those, yeah. uh, yeah, long between, between, you know, yeah. But uh, you know how it is like the, the, the more. The more advanced and the better technology is, the closer it resembles pure magic, right? <laughs> That's true. That is true. And that indeed is what, is what it looks like if you look up one of your demo videos online or also, you know, you just, you just got to see a picture of the robot, I guess. And also the picture, uh, screenshots of how the software shows to the people that are looking at the inventory, the inventory managers, what's, what's in the shelves. It's incredibly interesting. Uh, I actually have a nerdy question here. And I promise we, I promise we, that, that we're not going to go too deep into the nerdier rabbit holes, but I have one nerdy rabbit hole. How do you capture information? Right. So how is it that you capture the shelf's status? What's on the shelf? So not only if it's occupied or not. Um, and how do you basically relay that back? So what's your tech stack that's related to data collection? So I think there's, um, there's a number of different, different areas to, to the answer of that question. But, um, we use a combination of sensors. So we use, um, obviously machine vision cameras to be able to extract visual information of what's on the racks and to be able to process that information to extract additional value from, from every picture, um, to understand and interpret, um, barcodes, QR codes, to be able to recognize characters, to be able to analyze the, the boxes, the pallets and the, the goods that are on the, on the shelves. We use LIDARs to be able to do the 3D reconstruction. So LIDAR is a laser sensor that does measurement. It's very accurate. And, um, for us, it's very important because mm, it's not just about surveying the space and saying, okay, the racks are in the right position. Great. They haven't moved by themselves. We can be fairly certain of that. <laughs> That's um, weird. but, um, being able to do this 3D, this digital twin reconstruction using LiDAR allows us to take actual measurements of the goods in space, allows us to then calculate how much, uh, how well we're utilizing the racks, how much product we have available anywhere in, in the warehouse. Um, it also allows us to operate outside a, a racking environment. So outside of their, their standard racking systems in the warehouses where you have, um, where you have bulk storage of goods. You know, having this 3D uh, reconstruction allows us to, to combine. So we use, um, sensor fusion between images, between cloud points, allows us to combine this together and create, um, a data set that gives us a lot more information, a lot more insights. It tells us a much more profound story of what's going on in that environment. How we collect the information. We've sorry, we referred to the robots multiple times before. So we use, um, we use a fully autonomous robot. It's, it's usually one uh, required per, per warehouse. Um, it's very, very fast and very efficient. Um, it collects all this information. We process everything directly on device. Um, and this is a very important point because we're talking hundreds of gigs of data, uh, that are being processed 
And this allows us to push a very lightweight um, data package into the cloud. So index or review, this is where we um, aggregate and centralize the information, the data. And this is where we bring information from multiple sources. So if there's other uh, software um, platforms op- that are being used in the environment, if there's uh, multiple tenants in a warehouse, in a location, if there's multiple companies that use a shared space, we can create a single source of truth. And that's what what the Exo Review is, really. It's, it's a global visibility and intelligence platform, but it's a single source of truth that allows us to extract these insights and to correct all the other systems that are feeding information into it and also can be fed back correct information out of the Exo Review. Okay, that's clear. I have so many questions, you have no idea. So that's, <laughs> I'm going to stay on the, on, you know, on the level, um, that, that, you know, can manage one hour conversation. But I think if there's one thing that I understand very well now, it's you want to deliver performance analytics and you want them to be seamlessly integrated in their, in, in the customer's processes. You want to be invisible. You just want to be the invisible control point. So I think it's a great, it's a great place to be. Um, what do you think it's the evolution from here? Um, what's on the roadmap going forward? I mean, it's secret. I can't obviously tell you, <laughs> but I can share a couple of things. It's not that secret. We've been, we've been starting to, um, to discuss some of this, some of these items and, and explore a little bit further with, with some of our customers as well. Um, so at the moment we have this ability to collect all the information, to collect all the insights, to, to drive this level of, of performance. In the future, and this is not very far in the future either, what we're looking to do is um, focus a lot more on uh, some of the advanced functionality that we were touching on. Focus a lot more into expanding the Exo review into, into a, a, a going beyond the single source of truth into a warehouse operating system, into a, a platform that you go and it tells you what's been happening. It tells you how you can optimize things. So you don't have to use it for exploratory, for visibility, mm-hmm. for extracting the business intelligence. It gives you the information. It gives you the business intelligence. It gives you the recipe and the step-by-step guide on how to implement on that plan. So very much, um, very much a platform that allows you to run any product, any operation anywhere in the world, um, completely, um, you know, completely naturally. So it's, it's go, going back to what I was telling you about copy pasting intelligence. So it learns about how, how it uh, would run different products in different environments with different constraints. And then it, it allows you to replicate that seamlessly. It allows you to drive that performance into any operation without having to have any impact on the day to day running of the business. Uh, and I know this sounds, uh, it, it sounds incredible. It sounds close to surreal because. Usually you want to run experiments. Usually you want to try different things, see how things are working. But if you have a very powerful digital twin, you can do this in a virtual environment. In fact, if you have a real time fed digital twin, this is where being able to scan your warehouses daily comes into, uh, and multiple times a day comes into play. That optimization will happen continuously. Now that digital twin, uh, with its AI companions and sort of like the AI technology we built into it is going to be running the scenarios and running the simulation and optimizations in the background um, on a continuous basis. So it gives you the most optimal way of running your operations without, without even asking. So it, it's, it's one of those, um, it's one of those beautiful things that you, you come into and you say, okay, I've analyzed the information. I know where we're going. I'm seeing what orders we're getting into. This is the most optimal way to yeah. run it. There's probably two or three different scenarios you can choose. And then I will go and start optimizing and start making that transition and start making the space look like what you're looking to build. Um, that's, that's the direction in which we're headed. That's the direction in which we can see text review expanding. And then obviously the, the other big thing, this is a little bit further into the future is, um, this has so much potential that it will expand naturally outside the, the walls of a warehouse. So you grow, you, you grow this across multiple locations, like we discussed, but you grow it to an industry level platform because you have so many different ways of, um, integrating information and adding new sources of data into it. 
it would be a shame for us to, to limit ourselves to only operate in this, um, in this sort of like environment where we've started from. Um, we want to build and expand legs of review into a much wider logistics operating system to be able to, to really create a, a far more resilient, far more robust industry. You know, logistics, when you look at it, uh, a little bit more, uh, philosophical, uh, philosophical angle, when you look at it, it is the most important industry we have. Like all the stuff we have around us is spent some time in a warehouse. You know, there was raw materials that was brought into a factory. People have made things. And we've all seen what happened during the, during the pandemic when we had all the, the supply chain disruptions. It was, it was very difficult to get anything. So, you know, it's one of those industries that really kind of gets, gets the world, keeps the world moving, let's say. Um, and of course, you know, a big part of our vision, um, for, for the company and our product and technology is to make that industry better for the future, make it more resilient and, uh, and make it a lot stronger. And, and it's interesting. We probably haven't talked about it, but I, I do know the answer. I want to do it for the benefit of the audience. Where are you guys operating out of? Uh, where are you based? Where do you have facilities? So mm, the, the vast majority of, of our facilities are UK based. So we're operating out of the, out of the UK. Um, and now we're growing and expanding and we are, um, operating at the, I would say at the global level. The, the bigger focus for us has been, um, obviously UK, Europe, because those are the two immediate markets and then expanding in the US, but also very strong focused in, in the Middle East region. Um, and we are starting to get a lot more interest from, from pretty much other further remote areas of the world as well. I think, um, you know, people realizing the, the impact and the, um, the sort of like the performance the product can, can give makes them very excited. There's a universal problem. So I, 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 I love how that can really be applied anywhere. Um, a lot of these problems in traditional industries are very location dependent, but the logistics and efficiency, I think it's something that you see pretty much everywhere. What's your key insight in building the team to make this happen? Cause it seems to me like such a huge operation that you must be so excellent at hiring. Um, the right people for the right job and sequence basically in your org chart sequence all of the business units that you're running, all of the small subsets of your business. Uh, so how do you, you know, how do you think about hiring? Uh, what's been your philosophy there? So I think there how many, how many employees are now at X3? Um, so we are, it's, Fairly large size. We're, we're over a hundred. Uh, I think we're over 170 now. Okay. Then okay, super. Even, even doubling down on this one. How do you manage, you know, that complexity? So I think the, um, the big thing here is you're never, when you grow a company so quickly, you're never going to get everything right. Like there's no doubt about that. I think the important bit for us was to have a, a different approach and not try and pigeonhole ourselves into a specific industry. You know, some of that was, um, different, you know, as, as a founding, as founding team, we come from different industries. Um, some of the, f you know, the first employees and the early, early employees come also from different industries. Um, and I think, you know, the more you can expand, the more you can bring people with different, um, specialties and different backgrounds together, the better and the faster you're going to be at problem solving. So if you have, mm. Mm, everyone from a specific industry, specific background, it will shape your technology and your style and your product um, in that, you know, in, in, in that way, because that's what, what everyone's known before. And that's what everyone's used to doing. If you can branch out and diversify um, and bring people from different countries, from different backgrounds, from different, different industries, some that are faster, some that are slower, um, some that have uh, a high reliance on, on mission critical processes. Um, it allows you to really kind of prof your way of working. And I think it's, it's very, very important. You don't have to, to try and necessarily emulate something that's, that's already there. Because if it's a new product, especially with, with modern robotics, I think it's the industry itself is so new that I think it's, it's a great opportunity for anyone to bring value into it. So I think there's always going to be a, a, a high need for people to, to bring a, you know, to bring their specialist skill sets. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the bit that matters most is, is people's attitude towards the job, right? It's, 
you know, working in a full stack company and working in a fast growing company is always going to be really hard. Um, it's, it's not easy. So I don't think anyone should look at, at working in this, this high, um, kind of high performance, ambitious startups and thinking, oh, this is just going to be a walk in the park. Um, it's always going to be hard. But I think the, the attitude you bring towards problem solving, the attitude you bring towards, um, that, that mindset that you, you approach problem with thinking, you know, I can solve this. Um, there's no way we're, we're not going to find a solution for this kind of problems. That is probably one of the most important things. Um, you know, you, you have to be very proactive and you have to have this, don't want to necessarily call it limitless mindset, but at the end of the day, you just have to think that everything is possible. And just because it hasn't been done before, it doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible. It just means that, you know, maybe the right combination of people and technology and sort of like the right momentum wasn't there behind solving that pro problem at that point in time. And I love that philosophy because it's, it's a, uh, and as a, doesn't have a framework flavor to it. It has more of a feeling flavor to it, which is how I tend to think of these things. Not everyone does, right? Some people will look for very specific traits in the people that they hire and very, very, very specific, uh, flags it makes it easier. Uh, doesn't necessarily make it better. What, one thing that I wanted to double click on that you mentioned briefly is like, the term modern robotics. How do you, because I'm interested from a robotics development standpoint, how do you define modern robotics? Meaning, what is it that makes a robotics operation modern? Because I think that's a lot that this podcast is about. It's, hey, we got new tools, new components, new software, uh, you know, new talent, by the way. And we'll make, we'll make something very, very complicated, much more complicated than it was in the past. But actually, we'll make it look simple. So what's, what's for you, Mother Robotics? That's what it is for me. Um, how do you define it? How have you seen it shape up in this, you know, last decade? So I think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a good point because you have this concepts of novelty applied to various things. And, you know, it, some, some robotics applications like robot arms, industrial robot arms at the end of the day, you know, they've been around for like, I don't know, 50 years. Um, realistically, we've been using this huge, huge robot arms and we've been, you know, making all kinds of, of things on, on fully automated, not autonomous, automated production lines, right? Now there's a, a completely new, uh, modern trend, let's call it this way, where people can bring a lot of intelligence to the, this robot arms, a lot of versatility. So what, um, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago would require a, a dedicated engineer to pre-program the robot and train it in specific ways, you can have some of the, the cutting edge perception systems, 3D planning algorithms, um, and some of the latest AI technology to make that robot, yes, it's still going to be a big robot arm, but to make that robot, I'm not going to say intelligent and think for itself, that's not what the point is here, but to make that robot more robust and adaptable to its environment. So it makes it a lot easier to integrate. And I think that's, that's the big difference when you look at the modern robotics, modern robotic elements. Um, you look at some of the, the robots we used to have 15 years ago that would rely solely on markers or rely solely on, on wire guidance. You know, that's, that's just a, a guided system. There's no, um, there's no robustness. There, there's no resilience. If you, if you in, if you basically add something in its environment, any kind of disturbance, it will stop the system from, from running. Whereas now we have fully autonomous systems. We have a really good example of one because, um, it, it has this capability of perception and understanding its environment. It can operate in, in highly dynamic environments with, with people and forklifts around it, uh, with people kind of like walking in front of it, walking out of, um, you know, its path. And I think this is how I would look at modern robotics is this, new systems that have this ability to, to operate outside cages, outside sort of like very, um, heavily restricted areas in, in factories and so on. Um, and, and when you look at some of the cobot arms, I think that's, that's probably the, one of the, the more recent trends, uh, you know, a collaborative robot. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from having the right, um, software and sort of like perception and systems on, on a robot arm that can manipulate 2000 kilos. Obviously, there's a, there's a certain level of, of safety um, elements that you need to include there, but there's nothing 
stopping us from making these robots collaborate better and making these robots or bringing them into this modern robotics world. I think this is definitely a trend that we're seeing more and more of um, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to sort of like be able to use the right technology, the modern technologies, new materials, primarily new algorithms and new uh, intelligent systems to be able to do a lot more with things that, you know, with maybe, like I said, 10, 15 years ago, will require weeks of retraining or recalibration to, to do other tasks. No, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like it's a bit, a bit deeper than my definition of modern robotics. So <laughs> that, that made it, that made it slightly better. Um, I mean, I love it. I, uh, Andre, I, I promised you we were going to stay within the hour as you go, you actually have to go build, um, you know, building tall robots. So I feel like it's the type of mission for which I should let you free. But before I do, um, I always ask this at the end of, you know, these podcasts, what is the one piece of advice that you would give the, you know, founders that are building really hard things, you know, be it robotics, you know, um, you know, automation for traditional industries, something really difficult to adopt tendentially. And it's really difficult to fund. Um, how would you, cause that's most of our audience as well as most of our, um, as well as most, most of our guests. So how would you basically advise them to go? And I told you could advise them to, you know, in any, any, anything, honestly, let me greenfield it completely. I think, um, it, it goes back to, to the attitude and mindset that I was, uh, that I was sort of like hinting towards. Um, I think if you really care deeply, deeply about solving that problem, you will find a way to make it work. And like I said, you know, we bootstrapped this business for five, six years before we could even aspire to any VC funding. Um, from the beginning, we wanted to be full stack. So from the beginning, we knew that we're building something hard. You just don't take no for an answer because you, you deeply, deeply care about what you are building and what you're solving for. It's very important. If the, if you care about that, that customer problem and you believe in it, you will find a way. Um, I think that's one of the, that's one of the, that's probably the most important advice I have. If you want to find a million excuses, you can do that, but if you find want to find a million ways in which you want to try and solve that problem, you can also do that as well. But I think you know, uh, there's there's probably no sugar coating or, or like I said, there's no magic formula here. Is it's kind of down to you as as an individual. If you believe in it deeply, you will always be able to find a way. And if you couple that with your know, inability to stay close to a customer, then that that combination will attract investors. So I know you mentioned investors. You know, investors, they really look for that. They want to see people that are fanatical about solving the problem that they've set out to solve. But they also want to see customers that have, you know, like a deep belief that that problem is going to transform their business, their operations, their their industry even. Yep. If you, you cannot develop these things in isolation because especially in, in this hard problem solving environments and complex uh, businesses to scale you have to have that that very very close relationship with your customer because investors are going to be relying on them to validate that what you're building is relevant for the future everyone's everyone's aware investors are uh, you know there's a massive trend for deep tech funding um, in in probably recent years two years um, and investors realize that you know this is a long this is a this is not an, an immediate sort of like short term thing. This is a long term game. So they want to make sure that, you know, the right customers are actually validating that what, what they're building, what they would be investing in is, is the relevant thing for the future. Well, thank you so much. I think there's a lot there that, that a lot of people will find valuable. I think resilience and, and, and just tenacity need to be at the, at the core of this. Yeah. And you, you've put it perfectly, you know, resilience and tenacity is like, you, you can't go anywhere without them. Yeah, for sure. Well, for sure. You can build what you build. So yeah. Andre, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been really great to have you on. I mean, I can't wait to do a part two. Um, you know, like, allow me that allow me the, the ability to reach out and be like, Hey man, I feel like, I feel like it's, you know, a part two is due and, and we can do this again. I really had a lot of fun. 
I think if uh, if you want to do a part, I definitely love to invite you uh, here in our headquarters, and then we can uh, we can do a combination of uh, of video and conversations, and actually see some of the the things we've built here uh, firsthand. I love it. No, that's that's a great idea. I might actually take you up on that offer. Uh, so, thank you so much for this. Have a great day ahead, and thanks for for being the builders. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me.